Uh, we are going to get started. Uh, the, and the first thing I'd like to do uh, before we get into the program for today, uh, we've got some special people here, and I'd like to recognize Amy Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to. Um, I'm presenting to you today House Resolution 755, and um, the reason that I authored this resolution was because of an article I read in the paper late in 2010 about a gentleman from Hawkinsville who is an extraordinary person. I want to give you a little background about him. Um, he was born in Richmond, Virginia, married with two children. He's a Rotarian, like I am. And um, I think he got a calling, like teachers do usually. It, I think it is a calling um, at a Rotary meeting where there was some discussion about budget cuts. And he, as an MD, decided that he could step forward and do something really great for the high school in his community. As I said, he's an MD. He also has a master's in healthcare administration. He's worked in a variety of careers, including vascular surgeon. He then worked in the business sector at a medical product company, also served as a medical director of West Virginia University and CEO of Houston Healthcare for six years. His aim is to teach students with discussion-based college course type material and not just textbook. But speaking of textbooks, at the beginning of last year, he realized that the students were using outdated textbooks published in 1994 when the students were still infants. So he got involved and obtained electronic copies of an updated text before the, excuse me, he, um, yeah, and electronic copies of the updated text before the school managed to purchase the new textbooks. So he's working hard. He also helps guide students through college and scholarship opportunities, which is so greatly needed. When I read the article, I wrote him a letter, a handwritten letter, and just told him as a teacher and a legislator, I was so impressed with what he's doing. He wrote me back, and I just want to quote a little bit of what he said. I have found it personally rewarding to be able to volunteer my time and to work with motivated, intelligent students in their quest for a course that was heretofore not available to them. I have also found that being a non-educator in the school system has given the students a little different outlook on what the world after academic achievement may be. I have had outside individuals come and speak to the students with good reports back from the students, and I think this is the way to get the community involved in the education process that we provide for our young people. I know we're always trying to get our communities involved in education, and I think he is the epitome of a community support system. Um, he doesn't know that I was doing this today, and I hope he's here. I haven't even met him. I've just seen his picture from the newspaper article. I think he's back there on the back row. He is. Come on up here. Thank you. Thank you. I have a resolution to present to you for what you've done. My superintendent and principal said I needed to come to this meeting because <laughs> something was going on about the school that I needed to see. <laughs> but I didn't know this. Thank you very much. Do you want to tell anything? I'm sure the committee members would love to hear your comments if you want to. All right. May I speak sure. a minute? Amy sort of outlined exactly what happened to me. I spoke to my superintendent of schools one day at Rotary and told her that what could ask her what could we do this was during a budget time and everybody was worried about the millage rate going up and she said well let's talk one day so I went to her office and she said we need to get more volunteers in our school system how can we do it I said well I will volunteer to teach a little bit and see and she wanted the, the anatomy and physiology program for, for the year following uh, this is my second year of doing that uh, I uh, and encourage two other people to uh, um, volunteer with me. So I have a sub I have a retired physician uh, who substitutes for me, and I have gotten my wife to volunteer, and she has volunteered as a math teacher, and did a six-week stint one day for uh, one time for a uh, family leave situation, 
and she still volunteers now on a, on a substitute basis. It has been most rewarding. Uh, I think that we need to get volunteers into the school system. I spoke with a physician yesterday who is getting ready to retire, and he said, I think I'd like to do what you're doing. Uh, I have suggested uh, to other people that if you want volunteers, go where people are who volunteer. Go to the civic clubs and talk to them and explain what the needs are and what you can do and how you can benefit from this. I benefit personally. Your licensure situation to be able to give me a license uh, to teach this was much appreciated, and it gave me the opportunity to go forward and do this. Without that, of course, you would not. I would not be able to teach, and I do appreciate what the legislators have done with that. Okay, Amy, I appreciate what you've done. I will answer any questions if you have any, but I really I, 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 I appreciate this. Well, we appreciate your time and what you've done and the example you've set. And uh, It's not just always about money. It's about people with their t commitment and time. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. What we're going to do today, uh, we're going to have uh, each of the Metropolitan Superintendents give some remarks about their thoughts, their comments, issues they see, uh, opportunities, problems. Uh, the only thing that I ask of them is I don't want to debate the charter school amendment here in this meeting. You can certainly state your position if you'd like the Constitution amendment, but other than that, I really don't want to debate it here. Uh, also, if you have any money issues with the state, we've got the financial officer, Scott Austin, who's on the ground over here hiding. <laughs> And so if you have any issues, we will refer you to Scott down here after the meeting. So if you want to line up and, you know, you know, I don't want to riot here or anything, but here's your opportunity to go after him at this point. So we're going to start out, um, we're going to start out with Superintendent Healy from Clayton County Schools. And by the way, it was our pleasure today to honor one of your teachers, the Millican recipient, the only one in the state. Uh, we congratulate you on that. It was wonderful to see her and her family here. And I'm sorry that I couldn't attend her press conference at 1.30, but... I told her I had to come see her, hear her boss speak. So anyway, we will let you go because I know you're going to, going to there from here. That's but again, right. please, from both the House and the Senate, our congratulations again to her. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Speaker, uh, legislators. Ed Heatley, Superintendent, Clayton County Public Schools. I come before you today to talk about support that we would request from you. First of all, to let you know that everything's alive and well in Clayton County. Things are prospering as they should. Um, and we're trying to figure out a way to enhance and speed up the progress that we're making. A couple areas that I would ask, humbly ask the legislation, legislators to look at uh, during this time. The first piece being the attendance age. Currently in the state of Georgia, a student can make a decision to drop out of high school at the age of 16. Uh, I humbly request that you look at increasing that age to 18. I know there is a financial piece that's added to that. But if we're going to ensure that every student gets the requisite skills and knowledge, we need to have an opportunity to do that. And I don't believe that students at the age of 16 have enough knowledge or experience under their belt to make such a decision. Not only increasing the attendance age to the age of 18, but also continue to support the career and technical fields, the uh, CTAE courses, because we understand that not every student is going to go from high school straight to college, right. but we want to make sure that every student has a viable opportunity to be successful in society. Third, uh, we mentioned budget, and I won't talk about money a lot, except for the, the request to allow or for you all to support and allowing the school districts, the school boards of, of education, to the financial flexibility to spend the resources that we have in the best way to support our students. They are the state of Georgia students, but specifically, uh, they're Clayton County students that I'm speaking of, right. which are different than some other students, and I believe every superintendent would say the same thing. So I just would like for you to support the flexibility and ability to spend the resources that we have to do the best for our students. Uh, I don't want to elongate my talk, but those are the three areas that I would request that you all support the local school systems with the local superintendents, and thus, uh, at least in Clayton County, the 51,250 students that we have. Superintendent, thank you. It's interesting what the things you brought up because the uh, 
We've actually had a bill for 16 and a half in the Senate. Uh, it costs about $8 million. I think uh, going to 18, I think it's $28 million. Yes, so we're going in that direction. We, we get that message. Uh, House Bill 186 from Representative Nix last year, uh, the career pass, yes, that type of thing. Uh, and finally, from a flexibility standpoint, we've extended that, I guess, through 2015. So we didn't write your remarks, but I tell you what, uh, we appreciate them because at least – at least as respects Clayton County, we seem to be on the right path. So, again, thank you very, very much. I appreciate your time. Now, hold on one second. I'll... Let me say to you, the QB Study Commission is moving right that same direction, flexibility with yes. accountability, and uh, let you know we have a bill also, the 18 we're looking at, and we'll be debating it next week. So encourage you to come. It will be in Randy Nix's subcommittee. I encourage you to come and, and give us your input in that age. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you again for your time. Okay. Our next speaker is going to be... Superintendent Hinosa from Cobb County Schools. He's he's brought his he's brought his cheerleaders here with him in the front row. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity, members, and especially the Cobb delegation. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to give you some feedback and some input. Um, we guided our school board through a uh, process by which we came up with our priorities for legislation for this year. We know that you don't have any money and that because uh, we don't have any money but uh, we know that uh, as those issues arise as the economy gets better you will consider us like you will everybody else. So we focused on four other areas and very specific and first of, first of all we wanted to whenever possible reinstate funding for technical colleges for the dual enrollment piece. We're big fans of that. We think that the concept of credit and escrow will benefit students significantly down the long path. Right now, there's only 36% of Americans have a bachelor's degree. And in the future, it says that probably 20%. But 60% will require some kind of technical training. And so anything that you can do to help us push that forward would be extremely helpful. Just like you, um, as a state from the state level, we struggle significantly with benefit costs, employee benefit costs. We don't need to belabor that point, but that was an issue that was a high priority to our school board, and so we want you to put that, wanted to put that on the table. Similarly, with the concept that you just brought up, Mr. Chairman, you get, whenever you get legislation, you get um, a fiscal note, if it's going to have a statewide fiscal note, and we know that you look at that. And everybody needs to look at that, especially in these uh, conservative times with the resources that we have. We would also ask you to ask the staff and the resources to see if there's a, a fiscal note for the local district because sometimes there may not be a fiscal note for the state but there will be a, a fiscal note for a local district to, in the matter of implementation. Now that's the third thing. The fourth thing that I, that I would like to bring up is this is particular to Cobb and obviously this may not be popular with my colleagues but this is something that we would like the flexibility to have and that is um, fractional support, fractional penny SPLOS support. Um, and it's up to a penny. So any district that needed a county needed to maintain the entire penny, we understand that. But for us, as we identify our needs, that's something that our board, it resonated with us as to we look at our future needs. If we have that option, then we can be better stewards of our tax dollars for our local community if we have that option. Yeah. The, the final two things I would comment on, um, and then uh, certainly open up to any questions or comments or concerns that you have. Uh, specific uh, legislation, we ask you, certainly we're supportive of um, House Resolution 1150. We have a great relationship with Marietta City and our SPLOST and uh, the split. And so the FTE split is something we're supportive of, and so we would encourage you to support that. I know you asked us not to debate it, but uh, I, would, I would be remiss. <laughs> And if I did not um, state my concerns with House Resolution 1162, and I'll leave it with That's that. That's fine. So. Th thank you very much. In fact, you know, it's interesting, again, the study commission is true. One of the things that's one of the key elements being looked at is the definition of partnership. And I think we do deserve some criticism over the years since I've been here, certainly, that we do not take into account some of our actions, what the effect is on a local basis. And we have to do a better job in that area, what you were talking about with fiscal responsibility. Yes, sir. And that's because we have, as we all know, passed more onto the locals than the state has absorbed, particularly in the most recent years. The other thing, too, the fractional splash you mentioned about, that is also being looked at the, by the QBE Study Commission as well. And so, uh, again, uh, we very much appreciate your comments and your position, certainly on the other matters as well. I'm going to try to get through everybody, and then what we'll try to do is we have some time 
is some particular questions of members, okay? Stick so around. We're going to debate House Resolution 1150 that I support. Obviously. We're going to hear that today. Bring it out today and have it on the floor this week. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Okay. Our next speaker, I guess we'll have to call him the dean. No, what will be the dean at this point? Is it me? Or no. Which one? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Fulton. Yeah. Robert. Oh, we're going to do Fulton yet. Superintendent Vasa from Fulton yes. County Schools. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for giving us just a few moments of your time. Uh, first and foremost, um, I want to thank you for your support of education. We may not always agree um, on the how, but as a, as a community and as a state of Georgia, I've realized quickly as a newcomer from North Carolina that people care deeply about education uh, and that we realize that public education is the engine that drives prosperity. Um, I, I do want to share with you a couple of thoughts. Um, about how we move forward as a, as a school district. And we believe that if we want to continue to improve outcomes, we've got to think differently. And for Fulton County, we've spent the last 18 to 24 months thinking about leveraging the charter district system process to make that happen. Just quickly, you know, many of, of you are very familiar with this, this idea of what do we hold tight, what do we let loose, what's centralized, what's not. How can we leverage the, the limited dollars that we have to benefit um, the system and individually each school. Um, as, a, as a district, we've decided to do the charter system um, with some level of accountability, but certainly uh, a larger amount of autonomy. Um, and, and part of that discussion, um, and, and one of the reasons why I'm excited about sharing that with you all today, um, is this idea that um, our discussions came up with three big topics, and that is, what are we doing about the people um, in, in our district that work for us, the instruction and the resources? And some of the exciting things that I believe that this um, has for us as a whole, many of the principals will tell you it is very difficult to project the kinds of vacancies that we have in a district. And so, for example, imagine a day when we can provide a teacher um, a $500 bonus for letting us know February 1st that they're ready to retire at the end of the year and, and a, potentially a $1,500 fine if they wait till August 1st to let us know that, in fact, they're leaving. And we've got principals left here um, holding the bag, looking for vacancies at the last moment. And in a district our size, on any given day, we could have 30, 40, 50, 60 teacher vacancies. And that's just unheard of. Another potential opportunity, the good doctor that was here earlier, um, coming in and saying, I've served proudly as a doctor for 30, 40 years, and I have to say to him, sorry, you're going to have to go through a series of trainings and, and things so you can teach biology. Um, <laughs> and I just, I find that absurd uh, and hard to imagine. Although the state has done a good job providing alternative ed opportunities for, for people who want to transfer in, we think we can accelerate that in Fulton, and we're excited about opportunities to do that. And then the part people don't like to talk about is compensation reform. But I would argue that it is critical that we begin to look differently at differentiating compensation for hard to staff positions in a meaningful way, not at a $2,500 a year, but in a meaningful way so that I can compete with the pharmaceutical companies, the, the, the companies that are going after the same chemists and, and engineers that graduate from Georgia Tech who are mission driven. These young men and women want to work in our schools, but they can't get married, they can't start families at $35,000 a year. That doesn't mean I don't agree with PE coaches and, and art and music and others. It, it, we have to listen to the market. And what the market's telling us is those skills are hard to find. We've got to pay for them. Another thing to think about is dismissal. Right now, when I ask my principals how complicated is it to, to, to move to dismissal, in a district of 6,000 teachers, we dismissed only six in Fulton County last year. How can we run a, an organization this large and complex without looking at, at the kinds of folks that we have that aren't doing their job? So another important part of that, under resources, what are some of the things that we might do differently? We want to empower our local schools through governance councils to make tough decisions around budgets. We know the fiscal implications that we all live with, but giving a local school an opportunity to manage their budgets, to meet the individual needs of that school, is where we're headed. We're going to be piloting that this year um, with a, a small group of, of schools within our district, and we're certainly excited about that. Under instruction, one of the things I'm so excited about is this morning we had, we had an opportunity to discuss technology in the 21st century. They're calling it the I, IY generation. Most of the kids in our schools today have spent more time in front of screens than they have in front of people, unfortunately, with gaming, et cetera. We've got to think differently about it. I like to refer to it as a flip model. 
Right now, we teach the kids all day by talking to them. Then we send them home and do work, right? What most folks, and there's, there's lots of great opportunities for you to, to, to read about this with Rocket Ship and School of One, they do the inverse. They videotape the teaching, they tell the kids to go home and watch the teaching, and then you come to school to do your homework. You come to school to, to do the guided practice and work so that I can ensure you're doing what you need to do. And we believe technology as part of this resource reallocation in Fulton County will help us drive that. How, how do we plan to leverage this? We'll be the largest district in Georgia if given this opportunity to become a charter district. With 90, nearly 95,000 students, we realize it's a complicated mission. It's complicated work. We're going to stagger it over five years. I've provided you also a handout to look at how we manage that. Uh, but understand that we're going to have to, in some ways, there'll be people ready to jump on board. There'll be those in the middle. And then we know there's others we'll have to drag into this idea of local governance and control. The last thing I'll ask you to think about as you look at the way your bills and, and the work and the opportunities for decisions that you have out there, and we realize a district of our size would cost the state nearly $950,000 if we become a charter district. Um, we know that, that money's tight, but we also know that an early investment in building infrastructure to track the new initiatives that folks will have and be able to, in a very transparent way, be held accountable so people know what we're doing will cost some funding. And we want to be able to put Georgia on the map with this district charter. And truly, uh, having been in three states now, in Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, I believe this could be the driving factor to really help put Georgia on the map. Thank you. I was remiss. Don't leave a minute. I, I was remiss when we're also going to have all the information on all these superintendents because some of the ideas that you're talking about, you may want to talk about individually with them down the road, and we will provide that information to everybody as well because we can't do it all. So it's in here, I believe. So if you can cut. One other thing there, it, it, it would be $9.5 million <laughs> not for the uh, – if you, for the charter system, not 950000 But uh, Chairman Cohn wants to ask a question. I want to commend you for the, the charter system. And, I, and talking with you earlier, I was really excited about some of the things you're going to do in some of your clusters, which I'm really excited about. But I want to say I love your idea about the professors bringing in these retired people. And we've instructed the PSC, as you know, through this study commission, to allow, you know, if we allow adjunct professors in technical colleges and in the universities, why can't we do it in our K-12? So we're looking at that, that move, so I like that concept, and you gave me that, you know, we talked about that early on. Yes, and the compensation, of course, you know, race to the top and dismissal. Give them your input, they're looking at that, and I agree with you, those are areas we need to look at. Appreciate you so much. Okay. We're going to do questions at the end. We're going to do them at the end. Wait. What's for him? We now have Superintendent Will Banks from Gwinnett County, our largest school system in the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, anytime I go to Washington, we speak of the People's House. And for those of us who are Georgians, uh, when we come down to the Capitol, we think of that as a People's House. And uh, certainly, uh, most of us are awed as we look at the august groups that we have to talk to. But uh, certainly today, I will try to be very brief and uh, not repeat what my uh, colleagues have said, uh, of which I, I agree. I would like to uh, especially thank you for the things you've done over the last two years. I don't want that to go unnoticed, not just for us, but for across the state, where you've provided some flexibility. And that, uh, in these times of severe economic downturn, severe budget challenges, that has allowed districts to manage their budgets uh, well, and we, uh, we appreciate that uh, very much. We also want to recognize your efforts so far to amend uh, Chapter 2 of Title 20 of the Official Code uh, relating to elementary and secondary education to delete uh, obsolete, unnecessary, and, and unused uh, provisions and clarify others. While I commend you for your work on that, I, I would also challenge you, we probably need to go a lot further with that, and I'll mention some of those uh, 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 as we uh, go along here. And since I'm trying to not repeat what my neighbors have, I'm going to have to flip back through a couple of things through here. But uh, I also want uh, you to know that, you know, education uh, is certainly important, but uh, you all have a lot of other issues as it relates to transportation, water economic development, and we, uh, we realize that and appreciate uh, the work you're doing on, on that. 
In terms of economic development, however, I don't know of anything that underpins that any more uh, than education and has been mentioned uh, related to the uh, technical schools and the uh, funding for joint enrollment. We certainly would encourage uh, that be uh, looked at. Uh, in addition, uh, we know that uh, the greatest uh, economic development uh, too we probably can have to ensure that all of our counties, municipalities, and the state has a very positive economic development posture is a quality uh, K-12 education system. And we want you to know that we want to partner work with you to ensure that that's delivered uh, across this state. Uh, just as uh, the uh, budget cuts that many of our uh, my colleagues have mentioned uh, uh, we too understand uh, that's uh, uh, universal, not just restricted to my county or my district or my state or, or the nation, not even restricted to the nation. But in any case, there are some things that uh, uh, have really uh, sort of uh, been a little bit untimely. One of them is a health uh, arise in, in health care. And if, uh, you know, it doesn't make it bad news, don't get better with time. However, if you know that's coming uh, earlier, for example, for us, uh, we've seen that increase from December of 19 and, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> December of 2010 to uh, what will be the uh, projected uh, cost uh, in, in July of 2012. It was 162.72 per person. And 10, December 10, it will be 446.20 uh, in July of 12. That's a 274% uh, increase. And for us, that's $11 million. And uh, certainly in these times, uh, that's tough. So uh, any assistance or help you can give there in terms of either uh, looking at how this happened at this time or uh, assistance there would be appreciated. Uh, moving forward, let me just say that uh, we, uh, we really support, uh, as I expressed earlier, your efforts to look at providing flexibility. But, but let me uh, really encourage you to continue looking at that. And we've heard some uh, specific examples uh, given by my colleagues. But uh, there's about 20 additional things that really ought to be looked at. Everything from class size, programmatic size, salary schedules, uh, uh, all of those things that really should be, sh I'm not sure even needs to be in statute. Those are things that uh, should be left to the district. And I believe the greatest term limit or the greatest control is the local boards of education that have to face their citizens every four years. Uh, and uh, if they don't like what's going on, they can certainly uh, turn them out. But I think uh, that's one thing that we need to, while we appreciate the flexibility on this interim period, they need to be permanent. Uh, they don't need to be things that will be staring us uh, in the face down the road. Uh, we also want to uh, uh, recognize uh, the efforts that uh, is ongoing in the state by 26 districts and race to the top. And as we look at salary schedules and performance pay and whatever, I would encourage you to look to that uh, endeavor to really give us some good information on that. I think that uh, uh, while uh, we're not where we want to be in that, uh, I think the end it will be something that we all will be uh, proud of and certainly will benefit education in the state of Georgia. That said, uh, let me close and be very clear. I strongly uh, uh, suggest that you oppose House Resolution 1162 and House Bill uh, uh, 797. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent Davis could not be with us today, and uh, so we're going to have Deputy Superintendent in it. Uh, I think we're going to tape this just to make sure that Superintendent Davis knows what you said. <laughs> you know. Yes. Thank you, Chairman Millar, Chairman Coleman, and uh, other members of the House and Senate. 
I appreciate the Atlanta applause. Would you Would you like to announce who was your supervising teacher when you first started out in this field? Well, you know, there's a gentleman named Brooks Coleman uh, who, who currently currently serves, and I will defer to the chair. Best student I ever had, I tell you, wonderful, I love you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Coleman, Chairman Millar. Uh, I have the... Yes, spotlight. The, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, stand in. Again, I'm Steve Smith. I serve as Deputy Superintendent and Chief of Staff for the Atlanta Public Schools. Uh, in the absence of Chancellor Errol Davis, who is traveling out of state, uh, he did tell me to be sure and ask you all to ask very easy questions of me. Uh, in his absence, he is the one who's prepared to take the tough questions, but the uh, number two banana gets the opportunity for easy questions. So I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, this August group uh, this afternoon. Uh, please know that uh, we have a number of issues in the Atlanta Public Schools, and I'm going to, what I'd like to do is talk with you through a couple of the highlights that obviously many of you have seen throughout the local media. Uh, and in fact, many of you, I've appeared before uh, this group uh, at a time when I was representing uh, CNN and Turner Broadcasting, and I'm now back into the education field and delighted to see so many friends among uh, the ones of you who are in the room today. Uh, please know that in the Atlanta Public School District, uh, we've had the accreditation issue uh, that you're quite familiar with. Know that our board members and our superintendent, uh, we've worked closely with our community stakeholders uh, to really remove that accreditation cloud that has loomed over our, over our high schools. Uh, also know that we're extremely pleased that the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, SACS, uh, and its decision to move our schools from accredited probation to accredited on advisement, uh, that's the second highest rating from that agency. We feel really strongly about our direction as we move forward uh, with regard to our SACS accreditation. Uh, to put it succinctly, the board has not closed the book on its work. Uh, the members have simply begun a new chapter of transparency and collaboration. And we would have you to know that under our leadership of our new board chair, Mr. Reuben McDaniel, we're really confident in the direction that we're headed. Uh, also, our 30, 60, 90 day plans, uh, the superintendent and I, uh, and I really with a, a nod to corporate uh, we've come in and what we've tried to do is be extremely transparent with regard to our planning process. Uh, we have our 30, 60, 90 day plans that we put before our board. And the, the importance there is that we want you to understand that we have a very clear plan, a very clear plan uh, and that our curriculum and instruction department really remains the number one focus. Uh, we've stated publicly that our, our goal is to move toward a, a true K-12 approach uh, and in other words, every time uh, our school district or in the feeder patterns that we have that are high performing, uh, we want our students to remain in that feeder pattern uh, K-12 is what we'd like to see happen. Our job is to make sure that all schools have uh, effective leaders, uh, teachers, and support systems uh, specifically centered around academics. Also know that our race to the top funding, we're combining really uh, what amounts to about $40 million dollars uh, from Race to the Top funds and $10 million from the Gates Foundation uh, that has been extremely helpful to us as we talk about having an effective teacher in every classroom. And those funds uh, have helped greatly with us in terms of achieving that goal. Uh, these resources will help us do a number of things. Please also know that uh, demographic capacity study, uh, you may have heard that we have one of those going on, uh, some of you more than others. Uh, with regard to the district lines being uh, changed, we have uh, really what I guess what we'd like to communi communicate to you all as a group uh, and as a body is knowing that uh, we have budget constraints just as many other districts do as well. Uh, we've got essentially 60,000 seats uh, that are available plus, and we only have 45,000 students. So as a, as a result of that, our independent demographers have come in and they've analyzed data from the 2010 census 
and our independent, independent demographers have done so. What they've done is they've been able to demonstrate the forecasted models, and those models have uh, led us to the conclusions of the demographers at this point. They own the models. We will get the opportunity as an organization to have final recommendations, but we're going through some very painful uh, district lines uh, being considered right now, and that's what you're reading about uh, in the media. Also know that our CRCT plan update, uh, that uh, is another item that has uh, been very highlighted in the media. You'll recall that out of the 178 employees who were named in the report, uh, at this point we've had about uh, 125 that were placed on administrative leave. Uh, also we have about 50 who've retired or resigned at this point. Uh, we also have a very uh, patient but excellent working relationship with our district attorney. Uh, he has been working very closely with us uh, with regard to those individuals who we have on administrative leave. And Chairman Millar, in, in the absence of uh, Superintendent Davis, that is one issue that I think he's been pretty public about in the media. He's, he's patient, but we're, we're hoping to move that uh, issue forward and we are working very closely with our local district attorney. Uh, we've had a number of other items uh, that we've initiated. School safety is one of them. Uh, we probably, uh, we are planning to invest at least one and a half million dollars with regard to school safety. Uh, bullying, we are taking input. We've had uh, district meetings throughout. Uh, we've taken input from our individual parents as well as, uh, well as our school-based employees with regard to how we can best utilize uh, those funds to make a difference for children uh, inside the classroom. Specific to our state local partnerships, funding school choice, those are, uh, you know, since we cannot anticipate every piece of legislation uh, that would be introduced, we created three general categories uh, to use as our guiding principles. And the ones that you see in front of you on the screens, uh, those are our guiding principles. And I'll hit those highlights as I close. Just know that uh, we appreciate the importance of the dynamic state and local partnership in promoting student achievement. Uh, we are very much, however, in favor of local boards maintaining the constitutional authority uh, and control. Also, uh, we support a very robust combination of state and local funding uh, for public education, as you do as well, uh, and know that we will continue to be supportive uh, of those efforts. Also, uh, we understand, too, uh, that the recent economic downturn has proven the, the multiple sources of state and local revenues uh, they're certainly still very necessary to help us mitigate uh, potential revenue shortfall, and we'd like to draw your attention there as well. Last priority uh, would certainly be that we continue uh, our support of school choice through the administrative transfer policy uh, as well as charter schools. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to appear before you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I will take your direction with regard to questions. Thank you very much, uh, and I guess we will tell the Chancellor what a great job you have done here today, yes. in spite of being mentored by my peer over here on my right. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Okay, our last speaker is going to be from DeKalb County, uh, my county, uh, standing in for Superintendent Atkinson, who has to be out of town uh, with a situation with her father. And she keeps calling me, and she wanted to Skype in and do this and the other. I said, no. I said, Dr. Axon, trust me that I think it's probably more important that you be with your father and that I'm sure that Kendra March will do a wonderful job in your place. So, Thank you. No pressure at all. No pressure whatsoever. But hello, I am Kendra March. I am the Deputy Superintendent of School Leadership and Operational Support with the DeKalb County. And I extend greetings for Dr. Atkinson in her absence. Please know that we are very excited because it is a new day in DeKalb. It is truly a new day in DeKalb. And to that end, many of you have already heard her say, and if you haven't, I'll say it for her today, victory is in the classroom. And we are very committed to that. Over the last 90 days, Dr. Atkinson has um, been holding dozens of forums with parents, teachers, citizens, students, business leaders, community leaders, and others, just to hear what the community says we need to do about our schools and what we need to do to improve our schools. At the same time, we've taken steps to address urgent issues, and the first one being that we implemented a semi-monthly pay for all staff. And I tell you, they're very excited about that because it was a long time from December 19th to, June, to January 30th, so they were very, very excited that we were able to implement that new semi-monthly pay. 
We also um, have been conducting an audit for our central office staff, and I'll speak to you a little bit about that a little later. And we have implemented a system of checks and balances over our purchasing department. And all of this has culminated um, into what we are calling our excellence and education plan for, and that's our blueprint that's going to turn the DeKalb County schools around. Derived from that whole plan, which was part of our strategic plan, um, Dr. Atkinson held fireside chats, um, staff planning sessions where we were able to strategize and held principal one-on-ones with all 137 of our principals in DeKalb County. And through that, we have derived our five core goals, our five core goals, and they're listed in front of you. Number one is student achievement and success, because we want to ensure our students are prepared for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Number two, excellence and leadership. We are committed to putting a leader in every classroom, in every building, and in every level of the district. Number three, operational effectiveness, making sure we are committed. We are, we are committed to being sure we have effective operations and excellent customer service. Number four, safe and orderly schools. We want to instill discipline and respect in all of our students. And last but certainly not least, we want to improve our partnerships for education. And in doing so, we want to increase partnerships with all DeKalb County entities, colleges and universities, faith-based, community-based business partners that are meaningful, not just, say, not just in name only, but be sure that we have meaningful partnerships. What are our next steps? As we move forward, we, have, we are inviting the public to give us their feedback on the draft of the Education and Excellence Plan, and you can do so by logging in to our website and clicking on that link that allows you to give us feedback. She's, Dr. Atkinson is also going to conduct some more community meetings that she will be able to receive more feedback from those different groups that she has met with earlier. We also are um, going to take this to our Board of Education for approval later this month, and we're hoping that we can have some strong conversations about, about how we move our district forward. And certainly we hope to establish a system to let everyone know how we are tracking our progress and we expect them to hold us accountable. We are finalizing our excellence and education plan with the community and expect to bring it before the board, like I said, later on this month. And we're asking all of our stakeholders to give us their honest, honest feedback. In doing so, we want to thank all of our stakeholders for participating and giving us feedback up to this juncture. And please know we welcome your feedback. So please continue offering that to us. As you may have heard through the media or may have read about, um, th there's been an audit regarding our school system central office. In short, the audit found that we have a lot of work to do and a lot of work ahead of us. We are in the process of going department by department to establish position controls and align job titles with job descriptions and salaries all under one system that is fair to all employees. And that we, we take that very seriously and we will take the time needed to do that appropriately. Ultimately, the goal is to design an organization that drives our focus and resources to the school level and compensates employees for the work that they do. I will not repeat what, what my, um, the previous speakers have said, but I will say that we concur with it, what they've said, especially with the QBE, found, QBE spending, and we ask that you strongly consider allowing local school districts to have the flexibility to fund priorities as they need for their school districts. We recognize that there is very important, accountability is very important, and we support giving local schools flexibility with such, with such funding. I know I talk really fast, and I don't know why, because I'm a country girl, um, and I tell everyone that. But in close, I, again, I just want to tell you, thank you all for the opportunity to share a little bit about DeKalb County Schools. Again, we, it is a new day in DeKalb, and we are excited about the work we're doing and the, the work we are embarking upon, and we also are, are excited about the leadership of Dr. Atkinson. So again, on her behalf, thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Chairman Coleman's a professional auctioneer, but you might give him a run for his money. <laughs> you might give him a run for his money. Okay, what I'm going to do now uh, is I'm going to open this up for questions. Uh, and for the members, if they would just let me know if there's a particular superintendent they'd like to, to answer that question, or they can look at each other and decide who they want to answer the question. Uh, so at this point, uh, and again, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm just going to call out the number because I can't tell who it is from here. Number seven? Oh, oh how could I miss that? Right, miss Morgan. You know I'm going to have a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to the superintendents for your presentations. Uh, it's very helpful to know what's happening on the ground, and I appreciate uh, all the work that you're doing. I have two questions. Uh, one is for my superintendent. 
Um, if you would brag a little bit about uh, the things that are happening in Cobb in terms of uh, innovative work. We know that we've got to make some changes and reform at the local level. And so if you would talk about uh, some of what your plan is for the next one or two years. Um, and then my second question, for the districts who are participating in Race to the Top, if you would give us a little bit more detail on how that's working in implementation, what your thoughts are on the process so far, um, and the impact that it's making, particularly around uh, teacher effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Thomas, members of the committee, we are embarking on looking at some new initiatives. We know that uh, I'm convinced, after being in education, the superintendent for 18 years, that the model we have is going to have to change within this decade, not because we want to, but because we can't afford the model that we have. So we're going to have to come up with something different. And so we're going to embark on our strategic plan. I think we think that um, the path to the future is going to bring a lot of different ideas. Dr. Ovaso talked about some of the things that are happening all over the country, and he and I have been keeping up with some of those things. In Cobb, I've learned one thing. If you're going to change something, it's going to take a little while. So uh, <laughs> uh, when I got this job, I was 6'5", and I'm 5'6 right now. But, and that's only after six or seven months. So I know I've got to bring people with me uh, uh, along the way. But we do have, we are going to redo our strategic plan. We are going to involve a lot of people in the process. But we can't continue to do the same thing. Even as a great reputation and great success that Cobb County has, we also need to get better. Because our kids aren't just going to be competing with kids from Fulton and Gwinnett and everybody in this room, we're going to be competing with kids all over the world. So those initiatives will have to, will have to ferment a little bit and get some ground, some traction, but you'll be hearing more about those, and you know, I need to have the opportunity to bring the community along with me. On the second point that she raised about Race to the Top, I'd like you all to comment also on the, those of you involved in Race to the Top, that if there's anything that we could be doing different from, from DOE's perspective in order to help you, get the results we're trying to achieve here. Does somebody want to comment on Race to the Top? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, distinguished young lady was looking directly at me when she asked a question, so I take the podium at that look. <laughs> uh, in the Atlanta Public Schools, uh, and I would defer to our, our superintendent from Cobb who just mentioned uh, his six months on the job. Uh, Chancellor Davis and I have been in place for six months, and We've had a few issues, uh, as I stated earlier, and it's been uh, quite exhausting. Uh, but I'm very thrilled about the direction that the Atlanta Public Schools is headed uh, at this point. Uh, with specificity surrounding Race to the Top, one of the things that, that I can tell you personally, having been a principal in Fulton County, and I spent probably close to 12 years on the private sector side, and I'm now, as I said, just getting back into education, one of the pieces that is really helpful for Race to the Top has been the ability and the metrics that we are using specifically with uh, Race to the Top grant funding uh, with regard to measurement of student achievement as well as measurement of teacher performance and having an effective teacher in every classroom. Uh, I would tell you that for us, uh, it has been key, it has been critical uh, having the funding to be able to measure student performance and to have uh, what we refer to as dashboard. Uh, the dashboard with regard to measuring the performance of teachers, uh, my colleague from Fulton mentioned the ability to really expedite individuals who aren't performing. Uh, the, the funds that we're being able to utilize with Race to the Top funds will allow us to, quite frankly, as you would probably know on a private sector side, we're very quickly able to identify our A, B, and C players, if you would, in terms of performance. And the, the C players, which would be individuals who aren't performing up to par, uh, those are individuals who are critical to us having the opportunity to move those individuals quickly uh, from in, a, in front of children because they have an impact on instruction. Uh, anyone who has spent a minute around education understands that the rubber meets the road uh, when the teacher closes the door and it happens between the teacher and the student so we are very delighted that we've been able to utilize uh, race to the top funding uh, measuring that student achievement and more importantly measuring effectiveness of teachers and having an effective teacher in every classroom is absolutely critical and uh, we're just uh, delighted to be able to use those funds uh, specifically for that matter thank you thank you Superintendent Wilmex, you were very instrumental in us getting the race to the top money. 
and uh, you've been very heavily involved with this as well. Would you like to add some comments on it? I will, and uh, first of all, let me say that uh, overall, I think the project is going extremely well. Uh, actually, it's an, an initiative, not a project. Uh, remember, we were approved in the second round. That was about seven, eight months after the uh, schedule was set. That schedule didn't get changed. Uh, then we had a change in the governor, change in state school superintendent. So we got uh, about 18 months behind. So I think our biggest challenge is just trying to make up the time, but do it right. And you all know the four areas uh, of it is, is leader effectiveness, teacher effectiveness, uh, uh, standards and accountability, longitudinal data systems. Uh, and I think the, uh, uh, the thing that has gotten most of the uh, uh, discussions has been the, the, the teacher evaluation system, and rightly so. That's where what we do gets carried out. And I think we all know what the research says, that the two positions in education that makes the most difference is the classroom teacher and the principal. So as we look at that, uh, we have uh, uh, developed a uh, teacher evaluation system that looks at eight standards. Uh, there's a rubric uh, that ensures that uh, the teachers know exactly what that is. And, and overall, I'm not going to stand here and say everybody's happy with it. Uh, that would be a, a misnomer. But I think we are making progress, and I think uh, we uh, probably need to really look at do we, sometimes I remember Peter Drucker said sometimes slower is faster. If you need time to really make sure you can ensure success down the road, maybe you need to make sure that you are you, you change that schedule. So at some point in time, we're really going to have to look, was the original schedule does that give us the time in Georgia to get it? There are, as you know, 26 districts. Uh, they uh, make up 40, a little over 40 percent of the students in the state. And uh, I think overall, uh, uh, you know, things are going good. Doesn't mean we don't have our challenges, but the timing one is the greatest challenge that we have. Okay. If you could get USDOE to give us about another year, that really would be great. All right. Mr. Wilson, you're back there from DOE. If, if you would pass that waiver request on to the feds, it would be very much appreciated. And again, one of the things you've got to understand with Race to the Top, what we're trying to do, I come from the business world, we're trying to use other people's money, the federal money, to come up with the right system for teacher evaluation. So when we roll it out, we do it right. And that's why we are going slow on this thing, for those of, of interest. Okay, Senator James. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I represent uh, Atlanta, uh, Fulton County, and Douglas County, but I'd like to ask my uh, superintendent from Fulton County a question. Thank you for being here, all of you. You did a great job on your reports. Very informative. Uh, you said that uh, we, if we get the charter uh, school, uh, what is it? Char char the, dis the district system. District system. Char that will be the first one. I know that, isn't it, isn't it the same thing that Marietta no, I said City the, the Schools has? The largest. Be the largest. Oh, it will be yeah, the largest. largest. Not the first. Okay, how many others in Georgia I have it? And is uh, it working well? We've got right now 70,000 students under charter systems right now. Right. And, of course, and then we've, you know, we, because what happens basically, we've given the schools the option that we want them to either go IE squared, IE like Gwinnett County, we want them to go charter system, or they can remain as is. And we've, we've deferred that to, I think, 2015, I believe it is, yes, at this point in time. So by far, Fulton would be the largest. We have 70,000 students right now, and, it, and so that would substantially increase the number of students in charter systems. We've been working with those districts and talking with them mm -hmm. and, if you will, organizing some field trips to understand how they're doing it and some of the mistakes maybe they've made and some things they're doing well. But uh, we're, we're ready to begin operationalizing it if we get the nod from, from the state. Superintendent, couldn't we just have um, uh, schools that would focus on just different subjects or rather than char changing the whole system? So we're not creating a system of 100 charter schools. We are not doing that. We're asking to be given the same flexibility 
that uh, some of the charter schools that, that are operating within our state have. Uh, we're also um, asking that we begin to think differently about the portfolio of schools and options we have for our kids. We've got magnet schools right. um, in Charlotte. I mean in Charlotte. Sorry, I just moved here from Charlotte. Uh, We've got magnet no, schools. No. Um, and we, we also were you, got, were you the trade for Cam Newton? <laughs> they got the better end of the deal. Yeah. So, 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 we, do, uh, so we will keep our magnet schools. We, we've got a handful of, of magnet schools. Mm -hmm. We've got conversion charter schools, and then we have startup charters in Fulton County. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Wilson. Uh, Dr. Voss. I'd like to ask you where career and technical education fits in your plan. Yeah. So it's a huge driver. Right now, one of the things I've realized as a newcomer, I've spent a lot of time listening to folks, and a lot of my families um, have been telling me that they want more options for their kids. One of the things that fits in nicely, and I've already begun conversations with, with Gwinnett Tech and Atlanta Metro Technical College, to try to begin partnering so that we can have more choices for kids where they take a high school credit and they're getting college credit. Not your typical just English language arts and math. We're talking about construction, we're talking about engineering, welding, et cetera. And we want to be able to bring some of those resources into the school. What we have found, especially in South Fulton, a lot of our kids don't have access to dependable transportation to get to the technical schools. So we're trying to find innovative ways to bring those resources there so the kids maybe, um, again, we have found a couple of different places across Georgia and the country that are doing that. And we want to expand that for the career and technical ed. Thank you. You know, that's a, I'm going to probably shut this down right now at this point, but that's an interesting comment you just made because if you were in this legislature four or five years ago, the change that's been made is the fact that we no longer just talk about every child needs to go to a four-year college. This state has made a significant shift in the last four years. Matthew, keep lying your head back there. Where we're talking college and or career ready. And I think that's a very, very important thing in this state. If we learn anything from this recession, it's about jobs and skills. And so uh, we have shifted that direction. And we've heard from Metro superintendents today. I don't know if we're going to do it this session, but those of us that come back, we will certainly, I think, introduce the rural element next year probably and have a group of rural superintendents here. And I think what will be interesting is the fact there's a lot of common issues and problems no matter where you're located in the state. Gentlemen and ladies, we appreciate very much your all's time. Uh, I'm, I, if you could, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly do some Senate business, very briefly, for those of interest. And again, I, before I, I would be remiss, for those of you that actually have lobbyists working down here on your behalf, I want you to know as a group that uh, we are very, very pleased with them. I know DeCab, Gwinnett, and some of the other groups, so again, as well as the Georgia School Boards Association, okay, that do work very hard on your behalf. Okay, the three bills that I am going to assign in the Senate to a subcommittee, the first one is Representative Nix. Once again, the Senate will try to perfect his legislation. Uh, it's HB 721. It will go to academic support. Senator Rogers bill, SB 289, Nine. without my glasses, will go to academic achievement. That's on digital learning. And the last bill, my resolution, SR 738, which is, comes out of the uh, Education Funding Commission will go to academic support. Uh, we are going to adjourn as a Senate now, and in, the House will begin their meetings within the next five minutes.